Hello Java developers! My name is Matt Rabel and today I'd like to show you how to develop micro front ends for Java microservices. Let's giddy up! So this screencast is based on a blog post I wrote called micro front ends for Java microservices. Read through the blog post, right, to uh, learn all about micro front ends, what they can do, and uh, about jhipster and all that. And you know, these are the different steps. But in the repository for this blog post, there's a demo.adoc, basically a demo script that I created that is written in ASCII Doctor. And thanks to my handy dandy ASCII Doctor plugin, it renders nicely. And it's the same thing as the blog post, but it's just a condensed set of instructions. So I can do this screencast for you and it all works quite nicely. So we're going to use jhipster for this and you might be wondering, you know, what is jhipster? Well, if you go to jhipster.tech, you can learn more. But in summary, at its very basic, when it started, it was just an application generator that generated a spring back end and an Angular JS front end. So that's how long it's been around since like 2014 before Spring Boot was even around. And then when Spring Boot came out, we, you know, adopted that as the back end framework. And then over the years, we've added uh, Angular, uh, not Angular JS, right? Angular 2 and above is Angular. And then also React and Vue. This set of instructions will guide us through everything. And we're going to basically build a gateway with Spring Cloud Gateway. And then we'll build a blog microservice that has tags and posts and uh, entries and then a store microservice which just has products and you can upload images for those products so each app will also contain a micro front end and the reason for this is jhipster's default microservices architecture actually generates a monolith on the gateway and the whole point of microservices is to kind of make everything independently deployable right you should be able to work on the blog application and not have to redeploy the gateway and so up until we had micro front end support, if you modified, you know, fields or entities in the blog microservice and it required UI changes, well, then you had to deploy the blog and the gateway. And that's kind of violates the whole principle of microservices. So micro front ends allow you to package the front end for the blog with the blog artifact. And so that means you can just deploy that and then the gateway will suck in the blog UI at runtime. So it's pretty slick. You'll need Java 11, Node 16, Docker Desktop, and jhipster to complete this tutorial. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that on the right there and make sure I have all those installed. So Java 17, uh, yeah, it'll work. And uh, Node, I do know that Node 18 has issues with jhipster 7, so make sure and use Node 16. And then Docker, I have running. And jhipster, I'll just go ahead and install that just in case. I'm using uh, the wrong version, so jhipster 7. 7.9.3 is the latest version, and if you use 7.9.4, if that happens to come out, then everything should work there too. And so the table of contents here, we're going to build you know, Java microservices with Spring Boot and Webflux, so I'm going to use Webflux for everything. The gateway is going to be Webflux regardless, because Spring Cloud Gateway only supports Webflux at this point. It doesn't support Spring MVC. And then we're going to run our microservices. And then I'll show you how the micro front ends work and how you can get zero turnaround, which is awesome when you're working on UIs. And then we'll build and run it with Docker. We'll switch identity providers because it ships with KeyCloak by default. And then we'll deploy it with Kubernetes. I don't know if I'll do that because that takes a while. Um, but then we'll have fun doing it. So um, I've installed jhipster793 there. Let's just make sure. And then we'll create a new directory. I'll do this in my downloads directory. I've uh, got some stuff in there. Take micro front ends, jhipster. And I'll clear that out. And we'll download the reactive microservices JDL that I created. That's probably been like a year and a half. And uh, we'll compare that with the micro front ends version. So we'll start with jhipster download, reactive ms.jdl. And this downloads it from a JDL samples repository. So you can see that right there. That's on GitHub. And then if we did it for micro front ends, it'll download that one too. And then if you have the IntelliJ command line launcher installed, you can do idea diff one versus the other. And you can see here, the major difference is, first of all, I'm using React. That's why I'm wearing the React shirt. 
And then service discovery type is console. The reason for that is we're going to make that the default in jhipster8. And then instead of you know specifying the entities that'll show up in the gateway, we're going to use micro front ends and say, hey, those micro front ends, pull them from the blog and the store. And then we do have to specify the client frameworks for the microservices now. So it has to have React. If you want to use Cypress for testing that, you have to specify that as well. And then I change the service discovery type. And beyond that, there's you know not a whole lot of difference. Down here, I don't need those microservice specifications anymore. You know, what goes where. And I did add a couple new things for deployment with uh, Docker and with Kubernetes. So otherwise, you know, pretty much the same, just subtle differences to support micro front ends. And so there is this jhipster JDL plugin created by a guy at JetBrains that's pretty awesome. So if you want to actually modify, you know, JDL in your IDE and get code completion and, you know, telling you when your syntax is wrong and everything, I highly recommend that. You can see there it's got five stars, only four votes, but, you know, I was definitely one of them. And then to generate a microservices architecture with micro front end support, you run the following command. So jhipster JDL, that reactive micro front ends JDL. And then what I'm going to do is use mono repository. And the reason for this is just demo purposes, because if I didn't use it, it would create a Git repo for each microservice, which is probably how you want to do things in production. It just makes it so it's one repo. This uh, workspaces command makes it so NPM can run commands from the top level directory and applies to all the other directories or the other projects. So I'm going to start with that. And then while that's running, you can see over here, if you did want to change from React to Vue, if you want to you know, try this out, certainly use this demo script, you can override the defaults in that JDL file with client-framework, you know, Angular, or Vue. And the reason for Angular X is at one point, you know, we need to distinguish between AngularJS and Angular, and it's just legacy. So we will be defaulting to Angular or changing that to Angular for uh, jhipster8. And so once that process is completed, we'll go into the gateway directory and start Keycloak and console using Docker Compose. And you know what? We could probably get started on that now. So go into gateway and uh, start up Keycloak. So I have a shortcut for that, JH Keycloak up. And this is because jhipster provides uh, oh my ZSH plugin. So it has all these aliases. If you see JH there, it's got a whole bunch of them. So that's how I start up Keycloak. And then I can start up console as well, jh console up. And, you know, those aliases are the same as these commands right over here. Uh oh, well, console loader config. I'm on an M1 max, and so that's why, you know, there's that warning there. Um, but everything should still work. And if we were to, you know, open up Docker desktop here, you can see them running there. So that should be working. And then if you open up, you know, localhost 8500, that's where console's running. So that's all good to go. And so we can start with Gradle W to start that gateway. And you can also use npm run app start, but you know, one command shorter than the other. So I don't know why you want to use one over the other, but if you can't remember whether you you know created the app with uh, Maven or Gradle, then that might be a use for that npm app start command. And so we can uh, open the root directory in IntelliJ And this will allow us to kind of show how everything's working. We have obviously the gateway here and we have the blog here. Um, but let's look at the gateway first because that's got the micro front end setting for Webpack. It uses module federation, right, um, from Webpack. So if we were to go into this Webpack micro front end file here, we can see that it uses the module federation plugin. And the remotes are blog and store. And it expects to be able to remotely, you know, load those. And it's got a bunch of shared objects as well between, you know, this gateway and, you know, that microservice. So currently we don't allow you to mix and match, right? You can't have like, you know, React in one microservice and view in another because these shared, you know, artifacts aren't going to play well together if you do something like that. So currently we expect you to use the same client framework for each of your microservices. And so that's, you know, the gateway that's sucking those in. And then if we were to go to like, you know, the blog and look at its Webpack configuration, you'll see that it specifies also the model federation plugin, but then it basically exposes the entities menu and the entities route. So if we were to look 
at this file, you can see it's got all the entities in there, right? And then if we look at routes, that's got the routes that'll be sucked into the gateway as well and allow everything to work. So that's how the micro front ends are configured. Put that on the right there and see if everything's running. Looks like it is. So we can exit out of that one, exit out of that one and open up localhost 8080, make that a bit bigger. And then if we click sign in, it'll redirect us to Keycloak and we can log in. And of course, Google Chrome is smart enough to be like, hey, admin, admin, what are you doing? But you know, those are the defaults. So obviously if you go to production, don't use those. And then if you go to the entities menu, you won't see anything because you know it hasn't loaded any of those micro front ends because they haven't been started. So if you were to look in the console here, you can probably see, you know, 404 when it tried to actually grab those. So now we'll want to start the, let's say the blog microservice. And this does depend on Neo4j, I believe it is. So JH Neo4j up. And then start it up. All right, now that that blog is up and running, we can refresh the page. And there it is, right? So if we wanted to create a new post, we could be like first post, which is always fun, and uh, some content. And we don't have any blogs, so we can just save it. And it's all working, right? It's talking to that database correctly. So, you know, we could do the same for the store. Let's go back to our instructions and see what I'm supposed to do. Um, yep, open the store. And you'll see there's also this uh, npm run docker db up command, which can be handy if you don't know if you're using like Mongo or Neo4j or Postgres or whatnot. So if we go to store and then npm run docker db up, we're using Mongo in this instance. So it's it's actually pulling that one down since I didn't have it installed locally. And while that's going, I should make sure and let you know that I think it's uh, it's in our preferences here in Docker. You probably have to up your resources, right? I think the defaults are maybe a few CPUs and I've upped it to six. And then the memory is the big one because, you know, we got a lot going on here, a lot of containers. And uh, so you might have to bump those up to get everything working. What will happen if you don't is, uh, you know, things just won't start because there's not enough memory. Okay, so long goes up, and now we can start it with Gradle. If we were to look at console, you can see that the blog, it doesn't like it. What happened over here? Source was empty. Uh, this is something new that I've seen where uh, the health check for a Neo4j doesn't work, so we might have to comment that out. But I think, it's, you know, the app works, right? Like, it's just uh, something with that Neo4j reactive health indicator. It works fine when you use in Spring MVC. We saw this. Upgrading J Hipster to Spring Boot 3, but I didn't expect it to happen with Spring Boot 275, I think is what we're using. Everything still works. It's just a, like a false failure or a problem with console. Uh, if we refresh here, um, the store, come on, there it is. So the store, you know, works. And now if we were to refresh this one, then our entities are there for the store. So we could create a new project or product. Um, I like beer. So let's uh, choose a file there. And there we go. And now we're, you know, saving to that MongoDB repository. So slick, that's all working. And so now I'm going to show you how to use zero turnaround, all right, development that sparks joy, because why wouldn't you want to have joy sparked in your life? In the gateway, right, that's up here, we can run npm start, and this will open up a development server uh, running Webpack on port 9000. And so basically any changes you make will immediately be available here. So that's using browser sync. And so we can modify gateway source main web app, uh, the home TSX to basically make a quick change. So let's make sure and grab this. We're gonna put it below the H2 and then we're gonna see this right here. And we're gonna go over here, find that home.tsx because we use TypeScript for everything in uh, jhipster, so in the gateway. Look for that H2 right down here. Add it right here. So I can just paste that in. Looky there. Hi, I'm a quick edit. So all of that's working. Looks nice. And uh, you'll see, you know, everything just happens right away. So pretty slick. If we remove it, it'll get removed right away too. So 
nice zero turnaround when you're working on you know specific apps in this microservices environment but you do have to do the npm start for them to get that you know quick turnaround and so if you wanted to get in the store directory for instance that's the one down here we can do npm start as well and that'll start up on a different port so there's no port conflicts jhipster is smart enough and then if we were to you know open this up a bit and go into product right this is you'll notice it doesn't have all the entities in here so what it allows you to do is just work on that specific microservice so it's still got the shell and we do require the gateway to be running the reason for that is just we didn't want to like incorporate authentication and all that logic into each microservice so it's just like a bare shell um, and then if you need to you know do authentication or whatever it does that on the gateway and comes back here so that's why we did it that way it was just easier and you know why complicate things and so in the wrapper around the div and product.tsx we can change it to have a background color so we want to see that right this otherwise the ui will change before you can command tab back to your browser so uh, bg info got to remember that class name bg info grab that and then product tsx go over here find it product tsx there it is now we're looking for a row or a div right there we go boom yeah look at that so if you were to go back to the gateway though and look here or even here right on 9000 and go to product it's not here because this one is not you know realizing what's changed on that ui so um, it's still just isolated to whatever you're doing with that npm start command in each of those microservices and then the back end has uh zero turnaround abilities too thanks to spring boot dev tools so if you modify the back end class and recompile it spring boot will reload that as well so it's pretty slick um, i'm not going to show this and as far as looking under the hood of micro front ends we already talked about that you know looking at those webpack micro front end.js files and both of the gateway and in the blog uh, and now what i'd like to do is show it all running in docker so we're going to stop you know all these various commands exit exit and we have all these docker images running so i'm going to stop those with my d stop command and if you want to see the alias for that um, it's basically right here this uh, docker stop that and then we did create the docker compose uh, part of our jdl so because of that it created this whole docker compose directory with everything in it so we can open that up and check it out and there's a central server configuration which has the application configuration that spreads or gets distributed to all the microservices. So we're going to build Docker images for each application by running this command from the root. So that'll work if you're on a normal Intel device, but I'm on Apple Silicon, so I actually have to use this command, npm run docker arm 64 and so you can do npm run if you want to see like all the commands right that are available so you can see you can build them for each individual one from the top level or you can even go into each one and build them that way but because i use the workspaces command that's why i can do everything from the top level so npm run and while that's running i can mention that to make key cloak work in this environment you do have to modify your Etsy host file to have a mapping from, you know, 127.0.0.1 to Keycloak. And that's because how Docker traditionally works is it communicates like from the blog app to Neo4j using a DNS name that Docker recognizes. So it's like Neo4j blog or something like that. And that all works because it's never exposed to the UI. But in this case, when you log in with Keycloak, it's going to redirect and show Keycloak in the browser. So I haven't figured out a better solution this one seems pretty easy to do and it works. So uh, you'll need to do that or it just will basically give you a uh, you know host not found when it does that redirect. So now that all those Docker images are created, we can uh, start it up with Docker compose up or in the wrong directory. So uh, Docker compose. And so if you added dash D, then you would, you know, not see any of this and you'd have to use Docker desktop to see all the logs happening. 
I like the prettiness of the logs and all the different colors and so that's why I did it this way and then you can kind of see when things are starting up so if you did open Docker Compose you can kind of or Docker Desktop you can see the individual ones so you know one thing in here is you can see it kind of happening I'm not sure where the log was it was easier the last time I used this so um, but basically there is a there's a pause right it's like waiting 60 seconds well the gateway's already up maybe my machine machine's faster than normal that one's still going i don't know well let's use a old console to find out where are we at so it looks like things are up and running we still have that issue with neo4j but like i said that's been an issue with neo4j and source was empty even though it's up so what you can do i can show you how to fix this real quick i'll close that one if you go into the blog and you go into application config right here and you go into like help help um yeah management endpoint help you can go down here and do neo for j enabled false so that's like actuators uh, Neo4j health check that's not working. Um, so I don't know why, but you know, hasn't been for a bit now. But everything should be running. So if we want to go to you know localhost 8080 here, we can log in, go to Keycloak. You know that's running. You can see it's up in our browser there. And yes, Chrome. Sorry. And uh, you know we could do a post, create a new post. Howdy. Happy Friday. It's Friday where I am. December 9th there. So that's all working. Product, right? You can see that that change we made in the product is is in there, and then you know nothing on the home. So you know everything's working from that perspective. And now what we could do is switch identity provider. So we can uh, we can close all these with a simple Control C. I'll make this a little more visible here. And so first we're going to register a regular web application on OS0. So go to OS0.com. Put this over here. Back to our instructions. So log in. I already have an account, so continue with GitHub here. Next one password. It's pretty slick. And then remember this for 30 days. Oh, it doesn't like it. Try another method. Uh, security key. Got my Yubi key right here. Remember it for 30 days. Click it. So if I go to applications, I can create a new application and we'll call it micro front ends and make it a regular web application. Click create. And then we'll need to switch to the setting tabs and configure our application settings. So the most important thing is a couple callbacks. Uh, this one right here. So spring security expects a callback URL like this. Uh, typically it's like, uh, you know, right here, it's like Oscar or Okta or something like that. Um, the reason we use OIDC is because we use the same callback URL, whether you're using Keycloak or Okta or Oscar zero. And then um, we'll allow a logout URL of localhost 8080. So those are the only things we need to do there. And then we can save it. And then in the roles section, Create a new role. So I think that's under what? Users? Security? And we'll click the link. Roles, so we already have those in there. There they are, under user management. And then a new user, which I already have. And let's look at this user here. They've already been assigned those roles, right? Role, user, and role admin. So you want to create a new user because you don't want to use, you know, the user you use to create, you know, your management account. So if you were to create a new one, let's just go here and create a user. Or let me show you. You create, you know, email, password, repeat password. And then once you create it, there is a next section. So let's see, I probably have an email I haven't used here. So you'll notice here that it's pending the email registration, right? So one thing you have to do is is go to your email or set email as verified. So otherwise, like this won't work. And then you go to the roles and you know assign those new roles there. 
And then the next thing you need to do is add the groups claim or these groups, right? Role user, role admin to the ID token that's returned from Auth0. So that's under actions, flows, and select login. So we don't need a tour here. We just want to add a new action. So we're gonna install a custom action. We're gonna call it add roles. So create action, add roles. And we're gonna set it to uh, you know, post login and node 16. And then we're gonna grab this code here. And you're gonna see that changes the namespace to jhipster.tech. And once they're authorized, it adds their preferred username as an email and custom claim in the ID token and the access token. So we'll save that and deploy it. And now if we go to the login flow, we can drag it in there. There we are, apply it. And then we can edit the Docker compose application.yml and append this YAML block so we can actually, you know, specify these Auth0 settings. So the cool thing is that, you know, basically Spring Security allows us to just override the defaults for Keycloak and it'll start using, you know, a different identity provider. So if we go into that Docker Compose directory, right, in central server config here, and we don't even need these anymore. And we need the Auth0 domain, which we have back in our browser here. That's this guy. Well, let's get it from our app, so we make sure and not mess it up. That's the domain. Put it right there. Then you'll need it down here. And make sure and have that trailing slash on there. And then the client ID. And the client secret. And this audience here is created by APIs. And so by default, there won't be an API, but you can see there is one right here for me. If I were to go into there, I might be able to see the full URL. Yeah, you can see V2. So you do have to create one. It doesn't create one by default, but if you do, it will be basically API V2. And so now we can stop all our Docker containers, which we already did. Docker PS, nothing's running. And we can start it with Docker Compose up again, but make sure we save this file, right? I can check console to see if things are starting up. Maybe they're already done, right? Let's try it, localhost 8080. Now if we click sign in, should redirect to zero. There we are. No, except authorizing the app and it comes back and now we're logged in with our Auth0 account. So, you know, we can see all of our posts that we created earlier. Um, or we could add a new one, right? We do like beer, $10 in some states. There we are. You can also use Okta for your identity provider. If you're developing apps or APIs and you want to add authentication to it, we recommend you use Auth0 first. It's just more developer friendly and you don't have to talk to any salespeople. You can just, if, as you scale up, you can pay with a credit card, which is nice. But for Okta, you can see JHipster's documentation. It's very similar, but I recommend using the CLI and uh, you know you can actually do, where is it, Okta, Okta Apps Create JHipster. And it'll do everything for you. So I'm trying to get that same sort of ability with the Auth0 CLI. That's why I showed you through the web interface right now is because uh, the CLI will just create a, a regular web app for you. It won't actually do the, uh, the actions for you. It won't do the roles for you, but Okta CLI will actually create all that for you. So that's pretty slick. And then you just configure it, you know, similarly down here. And then if you want to deploy with Kubernetes, there is, you know, all of that in there. It did create a Kubernetes folder for us. So if we were to go to you know, the Kubernetes directory outside of Docker Compose. You can see it's got all the files in there and you can just run kubectl apply dash F and it'll deploy to whatever, you know, namespace you provided. So this is what I specified. 
you also you always should use you know a different namespace than the default because then you can blow it away if you need to and we're clustering the uh, mongo uh, db for the store there and then everything else is just prompts that you normally get if you were to actually you could create you know make dir k8s and cd into it and if you run jhipster kubernetes it'll prompt you for these various values and these are what I chose so I didn't have to you know run that generator so I hope you enjoyed this demo and it helped you how to better you know deploy your microservices with jhipster use micro front ends if you can because then your microservices can be independently deployable instead of having a monolith UI all in the gateway so you can find the code on github at auth0 micro front ends jhipster example and of course, the blog post is on the Auth0 blog there, micro front ends for Java microservices. If you liked this video, please follow me on Twitter. I'm at mrabel. My team is at Octadev. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can watch more videos like this that will brighten your day and make you a better developer. Thanks. Cheers.